gentlemen, welcome to the first CULS Speakers event of this term. We would like to extend, before we start, our thanks to our speaker series sponsor, Clifford Chance, uh, who are named number one law firm in the Chamber's global top 30 and value their relationship with the Cambridge Law Society to secure some of the best and brightest future lawyers for the firm. Uh, they have opportunities for students from first year onwards, and you can find out more by visiting their website, www.cliffordchance.com forward slash grads UK, and stay up to date by following them on Twitter at ccgradsuk. And now we have Arjun introducing our lovely speaker for this evening. Good evening, everyone. Today I have the privilege of introducing our guest and very own alumnus, Sir Christopher Greenwood. Sir Christopher Greenwood has been a judge of the Iran United States Claims Tribunal and an international arbitrator since March 2018. Prior to his appointment to the tribunal, he was a judge of the International Court of Justice from 2009 to February 2018. Before his election to the court, he was professor of international law at the London School of Economics and a practicing barrister who regularly argued cases about international law before international and English courts. Sir Christopher was educated at Raven Park School, Singapore, Wellingborough School, and Magdalen College, Cambridge, where he obtained degrees in law and international law with first-class honours, and was elected a Fellow of Magdalen College, Cambridge, in 1978. He taught at Cambridge for nearly 20 years, before being appointed to a Chair of International Law at the London School of Economics in 1996. His publications include over 100 volumes of the International Law Reports, a collection of essays, and numerous articles. He was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1999, made a companion of the Order of St. Michael and St. George for services to public international law in 2002, and knighted in 2009. In June 2018, he was appointed Knight Grand Cross for services to international justice in Her Majesty the Queen's birthday honors list. He's an honorary fellow, fellow of Modern College, and of the Lazar Park Centre for International Law and an associate of the Institute of Dry International. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Sir Christopher. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the invitation to come and speak this evening. It's actually rather nice to be home. I think I gave the last lecture that I gave in Cambridge in this lecture room uh, some 22 years ago. But my association with Cambridge goes much further back than that. I came up as an undergraduate to read law 45 years ago. Of course, we weren't in this rather nice building in those days. Lectures were held in the Mill Lane lecture rooms, one of the bleakest buildings you could possibly imagine. <laughs> Well, they're not quite as bleak as the ones that Oxford used to use. <laughs> the first time I examined a DPhil at Oxford, the examination, which I was told was a public examination that anyone could attend, perhaps wisely no member of the public actually chose to attend it, was held in a windowless basement room with three upright chairs, no table, and a light that had no shade, just a single bulb hanging from the ceiling. You know, a hardened KGB interrogator might have thought it was a bit lacking in the ordinary creature comforts. Anyway, I'm very grateful to you all for turning out this evening to come and listen to me. I can remember that when I was a student, the idea of going and listening to some old buffer, a retired judge or whoever, coming back to tell war stories about his own days at Cambridge was not perhaps always quite as tempting as the old buffer might have wished. Now I'm an old buffer myself. Um, I will try not to spend too much time talking to you about the age when dinosaurs still wandered up and down King's Parade. And that's not incidentally a reference to the older members of the Regent House before the debate there. Now my subject tonight is litigating international law. My experience as a litigator was that for many years I was counsel in cases both in national and international courts about international law and I've been a judge and an arbitrator in a variety of different international tribunals. But let me say that the first and most important lesson about litigation is the main job of a lawyer is to avoid it. You need to keep your clients out of court if you possibly can, because going to court is unpredictable and it is invariably very expensive. 
And one of the things that I think is a weakness of the way that we tend to teach law in universities, particularly in common law jurisdictions, is because we necessarily focus on cases to a large extent. We can easily give you the impression that what goes on in court is the entirety, or at least the most important aspect, of what law is all about. It isn't. It matters, but it has to be seen in its proper context. A practising international lawyer in a foreign ministry will spend far more time on the negotiation of treaties, on diplomatic exchanges, than they are ever going to spend on court work. However, having said that, courts are my subject this evening, and those courts are both international courts, of which there is now a rich variety, and also national domestic courts and tribunals. And I want to say a little bit about the way each of them handles international law. But first, let's have a bit of history. I want to take you back 150 years to the Alabama dispute between the United States and the United Kingdom. Because although it's not the first international law case, it is in many ways the most important. Now the background, in case you're not familiar with it, is that during the US Civil War, almost the entirety of the United States <coughs> Navy opted to support the North. So the Confederacy was desperately weak at sea. And in 1863, Confederate agents in London commissioned the building in Liverpool of two very fast ships, the Alabama and the Florida. They were supposedly merchant vessels, but in fact, if you looked at the plans, they were far faster than any merchant ship of the time. They had no cargo holds, but they did have lots of interesting holes or ports, which were ideally suited to the cannons that warships of the time used. And they were obviously designed as commerce raiders. Now, the United States government in Washington got wind of this, approached the British government and said, look, in 1861, when this conflict started, you proclaimed yourselves neutral, which we regarded as an extreme impertinence because neutrality doesn't apply in a rebellion. You insisted that the South had to be treated as a belligerent, and now you can jolly well put your money where your mouth is and apply the duties of a neutral state to stop these warships being built in your territory. And the British government's reaction to that was to do what any sensible government should do. It went to a lawyer. It went to Sir John Hammond, who was the Queen's advocate. In those days, there were three law officers. The Queen's advocate was the senior of the three, with the Attorney General and the Solicitor General being junior to him. And they sent the papers to Hammond for Hammond's advice about whether there was a duty to stop the ships from sailing and whether the British government had the power to stop them from leaving. The only problem with this was that Hammond had gone mad. He was quite literally wandering around the gardens of his country house talking to his daffodils. His wife had covered this up so that nobody knew he had lost his mind. The result was that the papers sat on his desk unopened for about a month. When the British government realised something was wrong, they got the papers back, in the days before faxes and photocopiers, because there was only the one set of them. And a new lawyer gave advice, which was to say, for God's sake, stop these ships from sailing. But by then it was too late. The Confederates knew what was happening. They sailed the ships with part of the construction work unfinished, fitted them out with firearms outside Barbados, and they both had a spectacular record in sinking and capturing Union shipping for the next 12 months. The Alabama in particular sank a greater tonnage of shipping than any U-boat managed to do in either World War I or World War II. It did immense damage to the US merchant fleet from which in many ways that fleet never recovered. And the Alabama eventually, having sailed around the world, was sunk by a US frigate nine miles off the French port of Cherbourg the American captain having sent message to the captain of the Alabama, inviting him to come out for a trial of arms and promising him that if any other US warship showed up, the captain of the Kearsage would order it not to take part in the conflict so that it would be a fair battle 
We don't do things quite like that nowadays. <laughs> Incidentally, the Alabama, which sank in the conflict, is still making history because nine miles outside Cherbourg was, of course, in the high seas in 1863, but it's now in French territorial waters. So there's been a long-running argument about whether France or the United States owns the shipwreck. Be that as it may, when the Civil War was over, the United States demanded compensation for the damage done by the Alabama and the Florida. The British government said, well, we had no legal obligation to stop these ships from leaving. But even if under international law we did, there was no power under British law to stop them from sailing. Now, tempers got very high indeed. You have to remember at this stage, Britain was wealthier than the United States. It had a far bigger navy. It was the bigger, more powerful state. Except that it had a 3,000-mile border between the British Dominion of Canada and the United States and 10,000 British soldiers to guard it. The United States Army at the time was still being demobilised, and it was about half a million strong. So locally, the power rested with the United States. And there were plenty of people in the US willing to go to war over this issue. In one debate in the US Senate, it was suggested by a Republican senator that Britain should be required to hand over Canada and its colonies in the West Indies as part payment for the damage done by the Alabama and the Florida. Interestingly, no mention was made of the views of the Canadians or the West Indians, but that would have been irrelevant in the world of those days. This was opposed by another Republican senator who said Britain was going to lose Canada and the West Indies anyway. Manifest destiny, the concept that America had a right to rule from one ocean to the other, would mean the Americans would get Canada and the West Indies in due course in any event. So why should the British get a discount on the damages <laughs> simply by handing over territories that were going to be America's one day in any case? Fortunately, wiser heads prevailed. The case went to arbitration. Now, then you need to look at the American claim. It wasn't just for the direct damage done by the two ships. It was for the entire cost of the last 15 months of the American Civil War. In today's money, probably about one and a half to two trillion US dollars. So we're talking here large litigation sums. It went to an arbitration tribunal in Geneva of five members, one nominated by the Americans. Interestingly, today, he wouldn't have been entitled to sit. It was a man called Adams, the ambassador who had negotiated the agreement to arbitrate. He was a politician. His father had been president of the United States. His grandfather had been president of the United States. But even better pedigree than being a Clinton or a Bush. The British nominated uh, Sir Alexander Coburn, the Chief Justice at the time. Coburn was fluent in French and German, so he was quite a good choice. Unfortunately, he had the most unpleasant personality in Britain at the time. <laughs> he was the only Chief Justice not to be made a peer because Queen Victoria disapproved of his private life. He had seduced one of her ladies-in-waiting at an early <laughs> stage. He flatly refused to speak to the other members of the Arbitration Tribunal at times, and above all, he thought the case was going to settle, so he didn't read the papers until it was much too late. This, incidentally, is a mistake which many barristers make today. <laughs> Never believe it when your client says, settlement is in the offing, don't spend a lot of time on the papers. You can be horribly caught out on that first day in court. In the end, the other three members of the tribunal, by the way, were a former president of Switzerland, an Italian aristocrat, and a Brazilian count. First time you've had two judges from the New World sitting in a case of this kind. They very skillfully found in favour of America on the law, but then held they didn't have jurisdiction to consider the indirect damages claim. And they awarded 15.5 million US dollars as damages. That today would be about 250 million, so it's again a substantial award. The British paid immediately by handing over part of their stock of US Treasury bonds, which tells you a lot about the UK's wealth in the 1870s. 
Now, why is the case important? It's important because it taught a very valuable lesson. That you could settle a really acrimonious dispute of this kind by going to arbitration rather than by going to war. And it had a dramatic effect on Anglo-American relations. Those relations had been scratchy at best ever since American independence. There had been one short war between the two countries in 1812 to 1814, and a number of cases where war seemed likely. After the Alabama dispute, the poison was drawn from that relationship, and I think it's no exaggeration to say that the very strong alliances between Britain and America in World War I and World War II would not have been possible if the Alabama dispute had festered on for 30 or 40 years, as it could easily have done. And it gave the idea that maybe we needed a standing court to hear cases on international law. And that led to the Permanent Court of Arbitration at the beginning of the 20th century, the Permanent Court of International Justice after the First World War, and the International Court of Justice after the Second World War. Now, that's the background in international law, and it suggests that right from the end of the 19th century, you've got this unstoppable progress towards greater international adjudication. That is not what happened. When I did my, what is now the LLM in international law here in 1977, the position was very different from what you might have expected. The International Court of Justice at the time had one case on its books, and it decided just after I'd done my exams that it didn't have jurisdiction to hear that. <laughs> arbitration was almost unknown. The only big contemporary arbitration was the Beagle Channel dispute between Argentina and Chile, in which a Cambridge-educated lawyer had produced a superb intellectual award which neither country was satisfied with. <laughs> they went to the brink of war, and the dispute ended up being resolved by papal mediation, a generous offer on behalf of the Pope at the time, which caused consternation in the Vatican because they hadn't done a mediation for well over 100 years, and there were very inadequate records of how to do it. Human rights? You could fit the entire jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights into a single volume, and there were no other human rights tribunals. And as for the position in national courts, well, I think the position in Britain, at least, was summed up by one English judge a few years later, incidentally, who said, ah, oh, international law, yes, I know about that. English law is law, foreign law is fact, international law is fiction. <laughs> and then it all changed again. <coughs> if you look at the situation today, the ICJ has 17 cases on its docket may not seem a lot, but if you keep in mind that only states can be litigants, and there are only 193 <coughs> states, many of which don't accept the jurisdiction of the court, 17 cases is a considerable load. Six of those have been filed in the nine months since I left the court. Moreover, although some of them are about disputes that I think you'd have to regard as the byways of international relations... Have you ever heard of the Iapotios? The Iapotios sits at the mouth of the San Juan River, the, on the boundary between Costa Rica and Nicaragua. It's about three and a half square kilometres in size. It has been the subject of three cases in the ICJ during the nine years that I was on the court. My first case was about the River San Juan and the island. My last case was about the River San Juan and the island. <laughs> At three and a half square kilometres means it's about the size of the Sidgwick site plus Newnham College. But whereas the Sidgwick site has this beautiful building and that award-winning eyesore that the history faculty has, the Iapotios is uninhabitable swampland. <coughs> By my estimate, it would have been cheaper for the two countries to pave it in solid gold than pay the fees that they ended up paying litigating over it. But there are a lot of other cases that are much more obviously of central importance. The Bolivia-Chile case, where judgment was given at the beginning of this month, the President of Bolivia attended the hearings in person. The Chilean cabinet were told they had to come into the foreign ministry to watch the live broadcast, even though that meant arriving at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 
given the time difference between The Hague and Santiago. The recent Iran-US case has caused pandemonium in relations between two countries whose relations are less than good anyway. The Chagos Islands, our advisory case, goes to the heart of issues raised by British decolonisation. And the two cases involving Qatar and its neighbours concern one of the most acrimonious disputes in the Middle East. The Iran-United States Claims Tribunal, where I'm now a judge, and incidentally, I am an American judge on the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. Do not be confused by my accent in that regard. <laughs> the tribunal consists of three American appointments, three Iranian appointees, and three third country members. And I was appointed to fill a vacancy when one of the American arbitrators died very suddenly in February of this year. But that tribunal, which has existed since the hostage crisis was resolved in 1981, has given out awards of well over two billion US dollars to claimants against Iran, and is currently hearing some enormous claims by the Iranian state against the United States, mostly to do with Iranian property in the US that was frozen in 1979, or armed contracts between the two countries concluded in the 1970s. So now as a grandfather in my 60s, I am trying to work out what contracts meant that were negotiated when I was still a university student, or in some cases, still at school. Incidentally, there can be problems in cases between two countries like Iran and the United States. In 2016, the Obama administration settled out of court a claim for something like three quarters of a billion dollars plus interest, about two billion all told. It was a prudent settlement to make, the tribunal gave an award on agreed terms, and only then was it realised that the money could not be paid through the banking system because of financial sanctions. In the end, it was paid by the United States transferring the money to the Dutch Central Bank. It was drawn out in cash, in euros, and taken round in a van to the Iranian embassy in The Hague. Um, such are the difficulties that international litigation can give rise to. <coughs> international criminal law which was completely unknown when I was a student. There was no course in it, nobody even thought to mention it. It's now a reality with the International Criminal Court, and I think even more important, the legacy of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. It's worth remembering that the ICTY eventually got custody of every single defendant that it indicted, despite the absence of an international police force. And the only people whose trials were not concluded were those like Milosevic, who died while the trial was taking place. Human rights, as well as the European Court, you have the UN Human Rights Committee, a plethora of special committees like the Committee Against Torture, the Inter-American Court and Commission of Human Rights, the African Court of Human and People's Rights. And those between them have made, I think, an enormous difference, in, often in relation to matters that today we would find it incredible ever went to court. When I was a university student here, a man was released from the local secure mental hospital where he had been detained for the previous 35 years. The crime for which he was uh, incarcerated in the first place was the theft of a bicycle in Cambridge city centre in the 1930s. The idea that somebody was simply left to rot under the Mental Health Act was only overturned by a judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. The idea that a prisoner can correspond with their lawyer without the governor being able to not only read, but also censor that correspondence, is the product of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. The transformation that they brought about is extraordinary. In arbitration, you not only have now an enormous list of interstate arbitrations, you have some 50 to 100 cases a year being brought by investors against the state in which they have invested under the ICSID convention or under one of the other agreements about investor state protection. And national courts, the transformation in this country was extraordinary. From the late 1980s and international law is fiction, by the early 2000s, you had a Court of Appeal deciding on the precise nature of the powers of a belligerent occupant in connection with, a case, with cases brought 
about the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And I once did a case against uh, Lord Lloyd-Jones, as he now is, uh, from the Supreme Court, who's lecturing at the Lauterpacht Centre, I think at the end of this week or the end of next. And that case concerned a Motor Insurers Bureau claim against the United States, where I successfully argued that the United States had sovereign immunity. I may say it was my only victory over David Lloyd-Jones, who was an old friend of mine from our Cambridge days. He roundly beat me twice more in the following two years. And when he went to the bench shortly afterwards, I wrote him a letter of congratulations saying, all I can hope, now I cannot get my revenge in court, is that you're humiliating the overturned by the Court of Appeal on at least two occasions, but he never was. At the end of that case, the Supreme Court deputy master who had heard it said, well, gentlemen, this has been a most interesting day, quite different from what I normally do. He'd had cases from the ICJ and from at least five other countries cited before him. Do keep me in mind if you have any more work of this kind. It's an illustration of just how quickly the culture changed in domestic courts. Now let me say a little bit about the differences in litigation in international and domestic environments. First of all, with an international court, you have to remember that whatever type of court you're dealing with, Iran-US, International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, they are multinational courts. The judges and the personnel come from a wide range of different countries. <coughs> And that creates a number of issues, one of which is language. Now, most of these courts work in two languages. In the case of the ICJ, it's English and French. In the case of the Iran-US, it's English and Farsi, although almost all of the work is done in English in the, in, in the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. But it isn't necessarily English as English native speakers know it. If you become an advocate in a court of that kind, do make sure you avoid those complicated double negatives which the British love so much. There's one report on humanitarian intervention published by a Foreign Office research team which concludes, and the best case that can be made in favour of humanitarian intervention is that it cannot be said to be unambiguously illegal. <laughs> I watched an audience counting on their fingers trying to work out where that triple negative actually came out. <laughs> It's worth remembering when you throw into conversation those sports metaphors of which we are so fond. There are a lot of countries out there where they don't play cricket. And they may not quite understand what you mean by a long stop, let alone by bowling a googly or batting on a sticky wicket. Incidentally, batting on a sticky wicket translates into French as dans le pétrin, in the bread mix tells you all you need to know, that the British talk about sport and the French immediately translate it into food. <laughs> but to make matters worse, even if you talk about a sport that another country does play, not every country uses sports metaphors in educated dialogue the way that the British, the Americans and the Australians tend to do. And there are lots of other little tricks, words that we take for granted, that don't actually work outside our own culture. I heard the Solicitor General of Australia in the ICJ, and I was a, a judge in one of those cases, talk about something being a furphy. Anybody know what a furphy is? Any Australians or New Zealanders here? Yes? Middle slide. Yeah, it's a tall story. You'd have actually got it if you'd listened to it in French. In, the French interpreter translated it as un canard. Apparently, Furphy was the man who invented the water coolers in the First World War, and people stood around the water cooler telling tall stories to one another. It didn't work at all as a comment, because none of us had the faintest idea of what he was talking about. <laughs> or take a more serious legal issue. If you look at um, the Middle East dispute between Israel and its neighbours, you'll eventually come back to Security Council Resolution 242 of 1967, which requires, amongst other things, that Israel should withdraw from, and I quote, territories occupied in the recent conflict. Not the territories. Now, there is a literature that would fill this room of writers arguing about whether the absence of the word the in that sentence meant that Israel did not have to withdraw from all of those territories, but only from some of them. 
Now, without entering into the question of what 242 actually meant, you need to understand that that argument means nothing to somebody who is looking at the Russian or Chinese text of the resolution. Equally authentic with the English, because there are no definite and indefinite articles in Chinese, and there wouldn't be a definite or indefinite article in a sentence of that kind in Russian. A Russian-speaking person I knew very well once in a course of a conversation said, there was long debate in Russia before the war about whether Jews are people. And I was completely taken aback by this until I realised from the context of what he was saying that he translated literally from the Russian what he meant was whether the Jews are a people for the purposes of self-determination. <laughs> Be very careful about making a mistake like that in advocacy. <laughs> a second point about the diversity in the court is that although gender diversity <coughs> remains very weak in international tribunals, you do get plenty of racial diversity, and perhaps more importantly in practical terms, a vast diversity in the background of the people who hear cases. If you go into a court in this country, you might get a court of appeal of uh, one woman judge who went to Girton, a male judge who went to South London Polytechnic, and a judge from an ethnic minority background who went to Oxford. But the point is, they were all barristers for 30 years before they became judges. So they have a common professional background and a common understanding about how trial is conducted, what happens in a court. You won't get that in an international tribunal, where very few of the judges were advocates before they became judges, and where very often you will find that the president of the court was a former legal advisor to his, own, in his government's foreign ministry. The vice president was from an international organisation. The most senior judge had been an eminent professor who'd never been in court. Now, that diversity, in my view, is a source of strength, not a, a source of weakness. But it means that you do not have that background which you could, of assumptions you can make in an English court or an American court or a French court about what is going on. You have to have a much broader outlook in your advocacy than you would do in a domestic tribunal. And take also the differences of procedure. In the English systems, we tend to regard the jury as being an important defender of the rights of the individual. In America, that's an article of faith. One of my first cases was the Lockerbie dispute between Britain and America on the one side and Libya on the other, which was eventually settled by Libya agreeing to transfer the two defendants who were wanted for the destruction of an aircraft and the deaths of nearly <coughs> 300 people to trial before a special criminal court made up of Scottish judges who would sit in the Netherlands. One of the things that came as a surprise, particularly to the Americans in these negotiations, is that the two defendants were adamant that they weren't going to stand trial in front of a jury, because to them, they saw a jury as a lynch mob of untrained people who would want to find them guilty as a way of doing something about a terrible terrorist outrage. And that's a graphic illustration of how something that is regarded as a safeguard for the individual in one legal system is regarded completely differently by people who come from a different legal tradition. A second point to keep in mind about international courts is that their jurisdiction is largely based on the consent of the states concerned. If that consent isn't there, there's no jurisdiction. So that very often means that you have a lengthy dispute about whether the facts of the case actually fall within the jurisdictional clause that the, state, the claimant state is relying on. And that can often produce what I call the Cinderella syndrome. Remember in the fable of Cinderella, the ugly sisters tried to squeeze their large size 45 feet into the size 25 glass slipper that Cinders had been wearing. That's what you spend most of your time doing as counsel for a claimant state in international law or for an investor in investor state arbitration, trying to squeeze the dispute you've got into what is often a very small glass slipper in the form of the jurisdictional provision in the treaty that you're operating under. That's why, if you read the cases, you very often get the impression that the court is missing the real point, 
Why in the Croatia, Serbia and Bosnia, Serbia cases didn't the International Court of Justice recognise that there were serious violations of the Geneva Conventions? The answer is it didn't have jurisdiction to deal with that. The cases were brought under the Genocide Convention, so only allegations of genocide could be considered. And lastly, you have to keep in mind the political environment in which a court, an international court, operates. I've mentioned the settlement of that Iran-US case. But imagine the difficulty of making an, the Iran-US tribunal work in its early years with the very acrimonious relations between the two countries. It reached its high point when two arbitrators tried to strangle a third in the foyer of the arbitration tribunal in the mid-1980s. I'm happy to say that nothing like that happens today. <laughs> and lastly, what about enforcement of these judgments? Now, many of you, particularly if you're undergraduates, may think, well, enforcement is the Achilles heel of international law. You can't enforce a judgment after all. The United <coughs> States has declined to uh, give effect to the judgment on the death penalty in the Avena case. Slightly complicated background. It was a Supreme Court judgment that led to that, rather than a decision by the administration. Or you have the president of Argentina at the time saying that not a cent was going to be paid out to investors, no matter what arbitration tribunals might say. Now, there are two points to make in response to that. The first is, what I suspect you're not told in lectures on contract and tort, and I certainly wasn't told when I was a student here, is that a lot of judgments of English courts don't get enforced either. You try going into court and getting an order that requires an estranged wife to let her ex-husband have access to their children. You'll get the order. Try enforcing it if the woman doesn't wish to comply. Or try enforcing a matrimonial exclusion order against a husband who doesn't wish to comply with it. And you'll find that you have a far greater task than you would ever have in enforcing a judgment of the International Court of Justice. If you buy a dodgy second-hand car and it doesn't work, are you entitled to damages? Yes. Will you actually collect on the award of damages? Probably not if the rather sleazy garage has gone into administration and, funnily enough, has popped up again with a very similar name, much the same people, but on a different site and with a different trading name. Enforcement is the Achilles heel of every legal system, not just of international law. And the extraordinary thing is that almost every judgment of the International Court of Justice has been complied with. Sometimes the weight was a long one, but it has been met in the end. And incidentally, Argentina did pay out on those investment arbitration awards. Now, a very brief word about national courts before we finish and have some questions. It's worth remembering that even a national court that wants to apply international law and thinks it's applying international law is actually almost invariably applying something a bit different from what you'd get in the International Court of Justice. There are a number of reasons for that. In an English court, whatever international law might say, the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy means that a statute will take priority, although there are now certain workarounds in relation to the European Convention on Human Rights. But in the end, the statute still takes primacy even if it can be declared to be incompatible with the European Convention. It can't be declared incompatible with other rules of international law. Even in states that don't have a rule about the primacy of statute, usually the national constitution takes priority over anything. Whereas, of course, in international law, you can't rely on any rule of your own domestic legal system to get out of your international legal obligations. Even the constitution takes second place. Precedent in a country that has such a system will often mean that the application of international law is extremely difficult. I was an expert witness once in a case in New York, and I was attacked by counsel for the other side because he attacked James Crawford as well. The two of us were then professors. We both written expert opinions. The two British professors, and I thought that's really antagonised James, who's a proud Australian. <laughs> the two British professors have not cited any authority on Second Circuit international law. Let me break it to you. There is no such thing as Second Circuit international law. 
there is only international law. But the effect of precedent and that kind of mindset on the part of lawyers often means that in practice, when you're asked to prove a rule of international law in a national court, you do it by going to domestic precedents. Have a look at the law on state immunity in this country as an example. And finally, you have the problem of culture and expertise. It's not easy to work in international law if it's a system that you're not used to. Let me finish with one story. One of the most difficult cases I had to argue as counsel was the case about General Pinochet, the Chilean ex-president, who was charged with various offences, but primarily torture, in the Spanish courts, who then sought to extradite him from the UK. Now, one of the issues that arose was whether there was a customary law rule of immunity for a, a state official or former official in relation to a charge of something like torture. One of the arguments I put forward, I was arguing that General Pinochet was not entitled to immunity. One of the arguments I put forward is that if you looked, there were dozens and dozens of cases in which state officials of one state had been prosecuted for criminal offences in another, mostly espionage, murder, sabotage, etc. Now, the question I was asked from the bench was, Yes, but was the issue of immunity actually raised? To which the answer is, in almost every case, no. Now, of course, if you look at that as a common lawyer, thinking in terms of precedent, if the issue wasn't raised, the case isn't a precedent. But if you look at it as an international lawyer, looking for state practice, which gives rise to a rule of custom, the very fact that the state in question didn't advance an argument of immunity to try and protect its official tells you a great deal. That's an important piece of state practice in its own right. Now let me just quickly sum up. International courts, domestic courts applying international law, are infinitely more important than they were 40 years ago. They play a much greater role. There is a vast body of jurisprudence that they've given rise to. That incidentally is good news and bad news for you as students. The bad news is there's an awful lot more to study than there used to be. The good news is there are more job openings at the end of the degree course than you might have expected. But I come back to where I started. Don't imagine that what is going on in the courts is the whole story. In many respects, it's not even the main part of the story. It's just a much more interesting story than it was when I was a student. Thank you all very much.